start by giving a little bit more uh, complete introduction to Manish Sabarwal, who is by far one of the authoritative voices on the issue of jobs and workforce development in India. So Manish Sabarwal is chairman and co-founder of Team Lease Services, one of India's leading staffing and, capital, uh, and human capital firms. It is also implementing um, India's first vocational university and national public-private partnership apprenticeship program. And the company has hired just under 2 million employees over the last 15 years. Manish wears many, many hats. Um, he's also a member of the National Skill Mission, Central Advisory Board of Education. He served on various policy committees for education, employment, and employability. He serves an, an, as an independent director on the board of the Reserve Bank of India and is a member of the advisory board of the controller of uh, the Auditor General, CAG. And he's also managing trustee of the New India Foundation and a columnist for, for Indian Express. Um, for someone who, de who needs no introduction, I've just spent mm -hmm. several minutes giving you an introduction. Maybe. So hi, thank you so much for taking the time to do this interview today. Um, as I said, you're a leading voice on the subject of jobs and you not only bring a theoretical and intellectual understanding of our labor market, but also a practical one given that you founded India's, you know, one of India's biggest staffing companies. Um, and then on a daily basis, you, you encounter hundreds of th and thousands of youth that are looking for work. And on the other side of that coin, you also interact with companies that are looking for workers. So we really want to hear everything that you have to say, and I have a confession to make that as I was trying to prepare for this interview with a formidable voice such as yours, um, I realized that there's so many things I wanted to, to talk to you about, and that 30 minutes was not going to be enough time. And so uh, faced with this challenge of trying to squeeze out every drop uh, that I could in this 30 minutes that we have together, and to capitalize on your unique ability to be direct, clear, and to cut through the, no the noise, of which there is a lot on the issue of jobs, um, I wanted to do this interview as a rapid fire challenge. And so in the first part of the conversation today, uh, I'm either going to ask you very, very short questions that you have to answer in like a sentence or two, um, mm -hmm or I'm going to ask you a series of true, true or false questions. Mm -hmm. Is that okay? Sure. Sounds you good. <laughs> you ready for the challenge, Manish? Absolutely, sounds good. All right, so here we go. So number one, the first one is a true or false question. I'll go easy on you to start with. So this moment in which we are seeing a confluence of different forces. So there's technology, there's climate change, there's rapid urbanization, um, you know, our next speaker, Ian Golden, has called this, um, you know, uh, an urban epoch. Um, all of these forces are upending the way that people live and work. Is this moment, right, this moment is a decisive moment in human history, as opposed to a not just another cyclical downturn? Is that true or false? It's false. Okay. Mm -hmm. See, I knew this was going to be interesting right <laughs> off the bat. Mm -hmm. Um, COVID is doing irreparable, irreparable damage to our economy. True or false? False. Um, estimates that suggest that the unemployment rate has gone up from 6.1%, according to PLFS 2017-2018, before the pandemic, to just over 8% per, 8 are accurate. True or false? It's true. They are accurate. Cool. <laughs> uh, unemployment will remain high at 8% or higher through 2021 and possibly longer. False. Okay. Is unemployment the bigger challenge? This is a short question. Is unemployment the bigger challenge or is underemployment? Underemployment. Define underemployment. I'm just not making, a, making enough money to... Um, keep hand, mind, and body together, but not enough money to pull out of poverty. Yes. Um, so unemployment, it doesn't matter what your wages are. But um, 
uh, because you can't. Everybody has different calibration for what is a need, want, and a desire, as as we should. But um, underemployment, in my mind, is a bigger problem than un, un, unemployment. I think I, I actually think unemployment is the wrong metric for India at this stage of our development. I'm really glad to hear you say that because it is still one of the metrics by which the world judges uh, labor market um, tightness and, and labor market success uh, for the global south where it just isn't a very good metric. Okay, moving on. What are the three things that government must do to address underemployment as well as unemployment? And the productivity, the productivity of our cities, the productivity of our regions, the productivity of our firms, and the productivity of our individuals. The productivity of our regions is obvious. I live in Karnataka. My parents live in UP. We both have the same GDP, but we do it with one third the number of people. So obviously, people in Karnataka are three times more productive. Um, the productivity of firms, if you rank manufacturing companies by size in the between the biggest and smallest companies, there's a 24 times difference in productivity. So if there's that much of a difference, you can't pay the wage premium. If you can't pay the wage premium, you'll never be productive. So you're stuck in this low level equilibrium. So the productivity of firms has to go up. And obviously the productivity of individuals. I mean, a good um, and and also in a knowledge economy, right? Because a good plumber is five times better than an average plumber. A good electrician is probably 15 times better than an average electrician, but a good software programmer is 100 times better than the average software programmer. A good CEO is 200 times better than an average software programmer. So the productivity of where we work, the physical geography of work, the productivity of our enterprises and the productivity of our individuals. And obviously the agendas are you know, cross-sectional and common and horizontal and vertical, but um, the productivity of these three entities is what will solve India's underemployment problem. Mm -hmm. True or false, there is growing precarity in the Indian labor market. False. Knew you were going to say that. Define labor market precarity. Um, India is the world's biggest gig economy for the last 50 years. We have 50% self-employment. So you can't ever get higher than the 50% self-employment that we are already at. So I, uh, precarity to me is informality at a certain level. And um, I mean, you can define it by predictability, but again, you start getting into the debate of unemployment, right? So I'd just stick with, and with poverty or underemployment, right? I think poverty is the best metric for everybody to use for even, I mean, people don't use poverty in labor markets, but poverty of the economy is probably mirrored in lack of productivity of our individuals, firms and our regions. Um, people are usually not poor in IT firms because they are only 0.8% of the labor force, but they generate 8% of our GDP. Farmers are usually poor because they're 14% of the labor force, uh, uh, they're 45% of the labor force, but only 14% of GDP. So I would just, it's, it's useful to use productivity as a metric for whether you will get paid higher wages as individuals, as firms, and as regions. Okay. Um, is the fact that 71% of regular wage work, is the fact that 71% of regular wage workers don't have written contracts precarity? It could be, possibly. That could be a definition, but they may be, they may have a written contract and still be, I mean, precarity is, I mean, what was a, a deep, long desire for my grandfather became a, uh, a want for my father and is a need for me. <laughs> so I think that this whole definition of need, want, and desire is, is complicated, I think. So I would get, I mean, a minimum wage is a mathematical concept. A living wage is a bit of a philosophical concept. So um, it's different for different people. What's a living wage? Um, so I would be careful with defining, I, I don't know what precarity means. Is it, is your life is precarious? Um, Sure, um, there's a lot of precarity in India. Poverty is, everybody in poverty is, is part of the precariat also, right? Or, or the largest part of the poverty is precarious. So I, I think I would go with poverty, I would go with underemployment and un unemployment because at least we can agree on the definition of that. Precarity would get into philosophical discussions on need, want, and desire, which are interesting, but they're usually not helpful for policy. Mm -hmm. 
you knew, Manish, that this question was going to come back after you called me out in a meeting where I said precarity was on the rise, and you said, explain yes. that. <laughs> so right, because 50% 50 50 of India is self-employed since independence. In fact, at independence, it was higher. So the gig economy is not new to India. India has, gig eco India has the world's largest gig economy, but it hasn't been what we call viable self-employment, right? There's nothing wrong with self-employment. It just has to be viable. And I think some of the modern gig economy is making self-employment more viable than it used to be because of the higher components of technology, the, the higher components of training, and the higher components of demand. So a self-employed person, um, a, a, a Ola cab driver or an Uber cab driver is more productive than a Kali Pili because of the access to the technology that they have. Their capacity utilization is higher, their skills are higher, and, and so they're, they have a higher chance at being more productive than a yellow cab driver being hailed on the road because your capacity utilization by definition will be lower than somebody who has an app. So I, I think that precarity is, um, is an interesting concept, but the, the notion of precarity is, is sort of romantic about the old lifetime employment, which had a defined benefit index linked pension um, and taxpayer funded social security. So I, you know, through human history, that has been a very small time. Um, it, it, it was just in some countries and for a very small period of time. Most of human life is uncertain. Organizations don't last forever. So sometimes these social security or these, what, what is the anti-precarity, which is defined as a job with General Motors in the 1950s, um, is, was a very small period of time in history when I mean, you want to guarantee buy a toaster. <laughs> I mean, don't look for a job. <laughs> so I, jobs don't give guarantees. Employers don't give guarantees. Companies don't, countries don't offer guarantees. Um, nobody can guarantee um, stuff. Customers, shareholders, as, we, as I've been saying since the beginning of COVID, shareholders don't pay salaries. Customers do. <laughs> so if customers go on strike, I don't know how you're expecting employers to um, make promises that they can't keep. So, so this whole concept of precarity implies that there is this, this, this entity which can offer guarantees for something. Um, I'm okay with productivity. I'm okay with poverty. Precarity for me just seems to be a concept where there is this romantic notion of a time long gone by when, um, or this golden age in the past when people did not live precarious lives. Mm -hmm. I, I don't think that was true for most of the world. And I don't think even in the parts of the world that we talk about it, it was true for a very long period of time. I think precarity in, in, in my mind is something really quite specific. It is the phenomenon of increasing informal, informalization in the formal economy, right? So you rightly brought up the gig economy. I think the fact that gig economy workers are self-employed contract workers that are registered perhaps better than you know, the multiple food vendors in terms of their visibility. Uh, they don't receive social security. They, you know, they, 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 as you said, are not viable necessarily. And, and that to me, that kind of growing informality in the context of the formal sector, which isn't necessarily captured by a metric like underemployment, although it is linked to productivity, I think is, is how I define productivity, uh, sorry, precarity. But uh, let me come back and ask you two questions, two true and false statements that we that you touched upon. So India, you said, has the biggest gig economy in the world. Will it continue to grow exponentially post COVID? Not if you don't define the gig economy the way I define it. I think that 50% of India will not. I think wage employment in India will go up over the next decade, two decades. And so we'll come back to that because that, of course, links to the fact that you don't think that the unemployment rate is going to sustain for as, uh, for you know yes. much longer. So we'll we'll come back to that in the long form question because I want to um, break that down. Public provision of universal social security is something India should work toward in the long run. True or false? Public um, that's not that's not a, that's not a true or false statement. That's an opinion you're asking me, right? I mean, should we or shouldn't we? Sure. These yeah. are all, the, many of them are, are opinions. <laughs> 
Yeah, yes. Well, no, I, I don't think so. I think that um, we can, it, it would depend on, well, in the long run, it would depend on what you define as the long run. So in the really long run, absolutely. Mm -hmm. But um, we, I think we also have to learn from our, we have to create fiscally sustainable social security programs. I don't think stealing from our grandchildren, that's really what most of the globally social security programs have done. You know, they didn't pay for themselves. They were not funded programs. They were pay-as-you-go programs. And they were designed for much for uh, human lives which were much shorter than they are today. So I think that absolutely. I, 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 I think that a modern state is a welfare state. But a modern state is not one that steals from its grandchildren as easily as some of the past generations have mm -hmm. in rich countries. Mm -hmm. Do you think that informality is a blessing because it allows for more flexible labor markets or is it a curse because it squanders productive potential? And before you answer that question, let me just tie it into a little anecdote, which um, I was uh, a, a few years ago, I was in a conversation with um, members of the South African government and they were actually quite disheartened by the fact that they didn't have the buffer of an informal economy, right? Fast forward to today, what we see is the unemployment rate did come down, but we know that that's because a lot of people, as you said, that don't have uh, a choice, that can't afford to be unemployed, enter the labor market in very low capacity. But is that buffer, that's what I'm getting at here, is that buffer actually a blessing because it allows for greater flexibility and and, uh, and 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 that cushion, or is it a curse because it squanders productive potential? I mean, uh, Paracel says he was a Renaissance physician. He used to say that the dose makes the poison, right? Anything that is powerful enough to help has the power to hurt. So life is all about balance. I mean, I think that um, I, do, I, th I don't think informality is a shock absorber that is good for the economy because in the long run, um, you just never pull people out of poverty, right? So the two shock absorbers of the Indian economy have been farm employment and informal self-employment. And both of them are why India is poor because we just made peace with that. So I think that um, beyond a point, if you think of it as a transitory phase to me, that's fine. I, I don't, and, and, but I don't define formality as an index link, de defined benefit pension with a contract for life and you know the 58,000 labor laws or 67,000 compliances that we have. I think that um, formality has to be defined also in a different way in the 21st century than it was by General Motors in Detroit in the 1950s. I think that if everybody's idealization is that, then I don't think um, you can make everybody formal. But I think for a country like India, where we are far from the productivity frontier, um, I think that in making peace with informality is lowering our ambition. It amounts to a declaration of surrender. We don't need to surrender. We can, we can move millions of our people out of informality and poverty. Um, I know you don't use those two words interchangeably. I do because um, a lot of people in poverty are informally employed. Or they're more likely to be informally employed than if they are formally employed. So you bring up an interesting point. How do you define formality then? If we're talking about the transition from informality to formality, what is formality if not registered social security, uh, you know, yeah, but it's not for it's not 45% social security, right? Today, the payroll deduction for low wage employees is 42%. So if you make so, so there would be four non negotiables for me, there would be a minimum wage, there would be a reasonable, so a reasonable minimum wage, a reasonable social security, safety and working conditions and leave. You know, just and 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 everything else is 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 sort of um, superfluous because we can't guarantee everybody the General Motors job of the 1950s, mm -hmm. um, which was an index link defined benefit pension. Can we can and this is just a yes or no question? Uh, can we get to the four non-negotiables that you just uh, mentioned? without also having a strong mechanism to organize and voice? Uh, yes or no? I think we could. 
I think we could. I, th I think that, um, you know, that that whole concept of um, trade unions or organizing being the only way, I, I think that fixed assets are no longer what companies are worth. You know, Tata Steel, when they went public, 90% of their value was the value of their fixed assets. <laughs> In my company, my fixed assets are 1% of my, my of my market cap. <laughs> I don't have fixed assets. Um, and so I think it's it, it, people overestimate how much my employees are volunteers. Yes, there are large parts, some parts of the economy where employees are not volunteers, but increasingly in a service economy, employees are volunteers, they have choices and, you know, employers who continuously treat them badly are, are at least not able to sustain their own success. <laughs> at least that's what I notice all around me, um, that um, um, employers who stay successful are not the ones who treat their employees as raw material. And this is not just for service businesses like mine, it's manufacturing companies across the 3,500 clients that I have, I see I can make out the ones who may be long term sustainable because they think of their um, only sustainable competitive advantage as learning not even as talent, because talent is a static concept. The only ones who learn, who continuously people are getting better. So I would say that if the only way to improve worker welfare in this country is trade unionism, that might be an incomplete view of the world is my view. Mm -hmm. um, Manish, every time I talk to you, I mean, I, I just, I always, this time I am actually recording the conversation because every Every time I talk to you, I was thinking how I should have recorded that conversation because every second sentence out of your mouth is a sound bite. Uh, you know, for the sake of our audiences, employers that are successful are not the ones that treat their employees like raw materials. <laughs> you know that we're going to be tweeting out that line very, very soon, but point well taken. Um, I, you mentioned manufacturing. So a couple of true and false questions about manufacturing. Can India still catch the manufacturing bus? Or, or yes. I can say if it's true or false. Yes, <laughs> India true. Can still, true. Yes, true. true. Absolutely. Okay. Incentives for labor intensive manufacturing are a good way to create jobs. They're a possible way. I, I think that we are still, um, it would be silly not to try. Um, uh, because obviously there is a challenge in India's, uh, raising India's manufacturing employment from 11 to 18. I don't think we'll ever get to 45, 28 or 29, which UK peaked at, US peaked at and China. But 11% of our labor force in manufacturing is the wrong idea. And till we fix hard infrastructure in India, I think we're getting a little better in our school um, and the basic level of skills, we still have a long way to go. But I think for to jumpstart India, sometimes some things need catalysts. So if we can offer targeted um, uh, bribes to em large employers to set up manufacturing in India and access um, this thing, sometimes, you know, um, uh, it, it, it is recognized in economics that getting the train out of the station is sometimes different. You need to do different things than to keep the train running or get the train accelerated. And I think that it has been a tragedy that 11% of our labor force works in manufacturing because the farm to non-farm transition is easier to manufacturing than to services. Just because it's a little easier, you can, you know, China didn't have this massive skill development program in the 70s and 80s, it just had a massive learning by doing and learning while learning program. Um, you just had these factories sucking people out of farms. And so their genius, which we respect is 200, 300 million people moving from farm to manufacturing. And um, I don't think we'll be able to move 200 million people in India to manufacturing, but if we move 50 to 75 million um, by attracting large employers that till we get our act together on a hard infrastructure, then we, it might be worth trying it. So this is just a trial. It's, just, it's not a return to the license strategy. There's also evidence in India when we look state by state to show that the structural transformation from you know what is traditionally understood as from agriculture into manufacturing or services is happening except that what's happening now is that it isn't in manufacturing that men, much of it is going into services and that to low end services so if we are to redefine what we mean by structural transformation as a 
as a shift from low end productivity to higher levels of productivity, then, you know, then manufacturing is a key part of the picture because, um, because there's plenty of evidence that actually shows that manufacturing has better wages, get better productivity, better working conditions than low end service jobs. So Manish, very, very quickly, true or false, if we just get rid of or suspend labor laws, small businesses will grow. <laughs> Fault. I am so relieved to hear you say that. <laughs> entrepreneurship is the only, uh, sorry, entrepreneurship is the solution to our country's employment problems. True or false? True. But a different, but only one kind of entrepreneurship, right? As an entrepreneur, I've, you can create a baby and a dwarf. Um, I think that we have too many dwarfs in India. We have 63 million enterprises, which only translate to 22,500 companies with a paid up capital of more than one and a half million dollars. So we don't need 63 million enterprises. So I think that um, a certain kind of entrepreneurship, a baby, my first company was you know, $10 million in five years. This, my, this company is a billion dollars in five years. So in uh, the, for my first one was a dwarf and my second one is a baby. And I think that we have too many dwarfs in India. So entrepreneurship is absolutely key, but they have to be productive enterprises which offer the wage premium. There's no point in asking our labor to self-exploit. <laughs> Largely, most ent enterprises in India are viable because the workers are self-exploiting. Mm -hmm. Uh, Manish, we're almost out of time, so I'm going to ask mm -hmm. you two very quick questions. See, that half hour just flew by. So if you were 18 years old again, what are the three things that you would do to prepare for the world of work today? Um, I think in a world where Google knows everything, um, knowing is useless, right? Learning how to learn is the key skill. And, and, and to my mind, at least where we talk about artificial I mean, intelligence, machine learning, automation, there are certain human skills, which I think are 21st century skills. The first one is conversational intelligence, you know, just the ability to know when to say, what to say, how to say it, where to say it is really more important than what you're saying. It's a really important skill in a 21st century world. I would say serendipity intelligence. You know, some people just know how to improve their luck. Um, there are ways to do that. I, I, I think since you can systematically think about how to be more lucky. Uh, there are no guarantees, but I know people. I think that's a form of intelligence. And I would say political intelligence, you know, the ability to compromise the ability to build alliances build coalitions you know that it's a really it's a re, it's a, it is a form of intelligence you know i and i think technocrats who you know the world of second best choices which i live in and which me and you fight about quite often um is um is my belief that um we're not trying to be right we're trying to be successful and um, that's a form of political intelligence. So serendipity intelligence, political intelligence, and conversational intelligence would obviously be, I would think, new for, uh, for things that the young kids should think about earlier in their career, rather than when I started thinking about it much later. Of course, lifelong learning is the only skill, finally, right? Because curiosity is, is all that matters. It's the superpower. But if you think early in your life about conversational serendipity and um, political intelligence, not, you know, people like democracy without politics <laughs> sort of drives me crazy. But, you know, I, politics is the art of create, moving forward, the art of the possible. Okay. Well, I'll be calling you to ask about serendipity training, but no, I'm not letting you go quite yet because you know my favorite part of this conversation, uh, you know, that I was holding out on was the word association game. So very quickly in one minute, I'm going to throw out five phrases and I want you to tell me the one word or one phrase that comes to your mind. Ian is already here. We have. I to know, start I know, but Ian is great. And Ian, don't you want to see the word association game? Yes, see? All right. Thanks, Ian. So here we go, Manish. Work from home. Um, living at work. The new normal. Hogwash. <laughs> Future of work. Future, Future, Future of, work. of work? Very interesting. The gig economy. Um, hogwash. <laughs> you, can't, you can't repeat, sorry, one more time. 
<laughs> Can uh, I pre pre presentism. Okay. It's a disease that you're obsessed with the present, which is not as special as we think it is. The demographic dividend. Possibility. All right. Manish, this has been such a great session. Thank you for being such a great sport. And, um, you know, it's always a pleasure talking to you. Thank you again for, for taking Thanks the time. Thanks a lot. Good luck. Good Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs> All right. Well, Ian, thank you so much for being such, uh, you know, so, so patient there and, uh, and uh, I, 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 as you can probably imagine, that that, that was also a, an excellent conversation that um, that we had with Manish Sabarwal, who is the chairman of one of India's biggest staffing companies, Team Lease. So um, yeah, it was great. It was great listening to the end of that. <laughs> Terrific. He's he's very smart. Yes, he is. Yes, he is. <laughs> Uh, so, Ian, now it's really, let me just turn to the audience and, and say, you know, it is my pleasure to introduce another authority and, and leading voice uh, in the global stage on issues pertaining to the future of work. So I'd like to introduce to our participants, Dr. Ian Golden, who is a professor of globalization and development at the University of Oxford and the director of the Oxford Martin Program on Technological and Economic Change. Um, from 2003 to 2006, um, Professor Golden was Vice President of the World Bank, and prior to that, he was the Bank's Director of Development Policy. From 1996 to 2001, he was Chief Executive and Managing Director of the Development Bank of South Africa. He also served as an advisor to President Nelson Mandela. His most recent book, Terra Incognita, 100 Maps to Survive the Next 100 Years, was just published uh, in October 2020. Thanks so much for, for being here, Ian. It's really a pleasure to have you. It's a pleasure to be with you. Thank you. Um, so, Ian, you're the author of many books. Um, I just mentioned Terra Incognita, but you've also written uh, a book that I really enjoyed reading, among many others, The Age of Discovery, Navigating the Risks and Rewards of Our New Renaissance, that you co-authored with uh, Chris Katarna, published in 2016. And to me, uh, that book almost seems prescient now. <laughs> um, I want to start by reading a passage from that book for our participants, and then I will come back to you to kind of break down sort of how you've seen some of what you said back then play out today. So the passage is as follows. The present age is a contest between the good and bad consequences of global entanglement and human development between forces of inclusion and exclusion, between flourishing genius and flourishing risks. Whether we, fl whether we each flourish or fl flounder, and whether the 21st century goes down in history books as one of humanity's best or worst depends on what we all do to promote the possibilities and dampen the dangers that this context, contest brings. Um, and I read those words and you know, I, when I read, I remember reading the book a few years ago and then I went back to it recently as I was writing an, an article, because really those words, as I said, are, are almost prescient. So what do you see as the most profound fundamental economic impacts of the pandemic? If we were to go back to, you know, February, let's say you and I were talking in February, could you have foreseen the, the, this economic moment that we, we are in right now? And, and what are the, the most fundamental and profound impacts of the pandemic? And how long and deep do you think this crisis will be? Well, thanks, Sabina, for, for reading my books and remembering them, <laughs> um, which is a, a, you know, a real pleasure for an author to know that people take these things seriously uh, and retain them. Um, I think, just with your first question, uh, could we have foreseen this? Yes. You know, the surprise to me is not that there's been a pandemic or that it's led to a global economic disaster, mass suffering and poverty. Um, that we knew was likely to happen. Uh, I predicted it in Age of Discovery. 
in the book uh, I did previously, The Butterfly Defect, Why Globalization Creates Systemic Risks. And every year uh, for the last 10 years, not just me, many people have seen the global pandemic as inevitable uh, and that it would inevitably lead to a global economic crisis. So why don't we do anything about it? Why don't we stop it is the question really we should be asking. And will this be the last pandemic? Will this be the pandemic to end all pandemics? Like the Second World War was the war to end all world wars. Um, and that's absolutely possible. And that's my hope that it is a wake up call um, that we currently spend globally maybe 20,000 times more money on military than we do on pandemic management when anyone that knows the relative risks associated with these two different things will tell you that a pandemic is many thousands of times more likely to kill us uh, or to, to ruin our lives and livelihoods. So we need to get our proportions right. Um, and of course that requires actions on the ground for pandemic management, but also reinforcing organizations like the World Health Organization, which should be the NATO, a global fighting force uh, to stop pandemics and absolutely could be. So the first thing is globalization brings good things, including this ability to communicate with each other, to learn things around the world, to have vaccines um, and many, many other wonderful things, but it brings bad things. Uh, cascading financial crises, cyber attacks, pandemics, climate change, and other disasters. And, it, and we cannot carry on in this way. It's totally unsustainable uh, because those bad things will get worse. And so this has to be a wake up call. In terms of your second question of um, how bad is this and how long will it last? Uh, I think it's, it, in terms of the deadliness of a pandemic, it's actually not nearly as deadly as the Spanish flu or previous pandemics could have been, but we're much more contagious because we have many more people and much more connection and we are more interdependent. The impact on different economies is totally different. I mean, we've seen China, South Korea, Taiwan already exit the pandemic effectively. Uh, their economies have recovered. China will have probably five, six percent growth rate this year. Um, India, the US, Brazil, devastating. Uh, UK, France, uh, similarly so. And uh, the, the tra real tragedy, uh, as you're experiencing in India, is in countries where there's no safety net. Uh, you know, here in the UK, no one's gonna die of starvation as a result of this pandemic. If they do, it's a huge failure of the system. Uh, there are massive food banks and other infrastructure. But in India, many people will die. Uh, and that's, f that's not from the pandemic. Yes, many people will die from the pandemic, but there's more people will die of hunger uh, and starvation. And then there's all the mental health implications which are so hidden, suicides, uh, depression, uh, which is a global phenomenon. So um, my view is that this is likely to end in the advanced economies uh, within the next six months because they'll have vaccines, uh, because they, they'll escape and there'll be a rapid bounce back. Uh, but in poor countries, including India, it's gonna be a, a two or three year uh, longer slog and for Africa, much worse. And that's because it's going to be much more difficult to get vaccines uh, into the system uh, in sufficient quantities. So it's it's going to in, it, what the pandemic's done in all countries, in rich countries and in poor countries, is widen inequalities dramatically. Um, in rich countries, there's a safety net uh, which protects people, but 125 million more people around the world have been forced into extreme poverty, uh, at least, and. Um, so it's, it's the most devastating crisis the world has seen since the Second World War by far. And uh, it totally derails the sustainable development goals and others. That's why we mustn't bounce back. Uh, that's why, you know, I, my nightmare is the idea that we go back to normal because mm -hmm. that normal that got us to where we are. Uh, that normal means we will inevitably have more pandemics in the future. We inevitably will have escalating climate change. We inevitably will have growing inequality. That's not the world I want to live in. 
uh, and I'm sure none of the people participating in this um, webinar want to live in that world. So we have to change our ways globally and nationally if we do at least out of this terrible suffering uh, come out stronger. Mm -hmm. No, thank you, Ian. I, I think that th those this, these remarks as, as opening remarks are, are really valuable because they touch upon so many of the issues that I'd like to delve a little bit deeper with you uh, through this conversation. Um, because as you rightly just pointed out, um, it's one thing to consider the impact of pandemics or of climate change, but it's another thing to consider the fact that our institutions have not kept up with the pace of change, that we've constructed a global economic system that is not conducive to taking care of people in the face of such challenges. And so I, I'd like to come back to that. But what, what I think is, uh, but bef before we come to that, you know, when I was talking to Manish, um, as you caught some of it, you know, I was throwing a bunch of true or false questions at him. <laughs> I wanted to mix up the format a little bit. So one of the things I said to him was, um, you know, this moment in which we're seeing the confluence of different forces, we're seeing advancements in technology, we're seeing climate change, rapid urbanization, which I think you've called, you know, the urban epoch, um, that are upending the way that people live and work. You know, I asked him, true or false, this moment is a decisive moment in human history as opposed to just another cyclical downturn. Now, how would you, would you, I mean, based on what you just said, I can, I, I have a sense of what you might say, but what would you say, true or false? Absolutely. Um, we're at a crossroads in human history uh, and the decisions we take this year, coming few years, will set the pattern of humanity for the next hundred years. Uh, because if we learn to cooperate and manage ourselves as a planet, within nations, between nations, stop global threats, then we're on a path of a more inclusive uh, shared prosperity globally, where we manage climate change, we stop pandemics, etc. Mm -hmm. If we don't, um, if this leads to growing inequality, growing populism, growing conflict between countries, less ability to manage, we're really in a downward spiral. And it's a nightmare world uh, of escalating inequality, climate change, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the choices we face now, I really do believe, and I know it's the vanity of every generation to say this time is different. You know, it's a very special time, the decisions we make. The difference between this time and previous times is this truly global now. So what India does or what the UK does, what the US does, will impact people around the world. The world, the Second World War was terrible and people felt that was a decisive moment in human history. But actually it was really mainly about Europe and you know, a few other countries, Japan, etc. cetera. It, it wasn't really about India uh, at that point. Uh, obviously, there was decolonization afterwards. So um, this is global, and this there's and what the pandemic has shown us is that every one of the seven billion people on Earth are touched by it, uh, and that's new. It's the first time we've had a global event that affects everyone on Earth simultaneously, mm -hmm. and that's historic. And it's part of this new this new realization of how entangled we all are, our lives, where, wherever we are in the world. And the pandemic can come from anywhere. Climate change is gonna affect people everywhere. That's the new world. Um, so we need to change our ways. And I think it is an absolutely decisive time. It's a crossroads. So what's interesting, Ian, is that Manish actually answered that question by saying false. Right? Oh, really? I didn't hear <laughs> yeah. that part. <laughs> He did. That was the first thing I asked him. And he, and he, and he, he said false. Now, of course, he's not here to explain why, but, but I imagine the reason that he said that he thought that that was false was because with that, with the acceptance that we are in this unprecedented moment, also comes a certain degree of fear that we don't have the institutions and the systems in place to be able to deal with the current challenges that we're confronting. And so I think his saying false was also in some ways a shrouded message of hope in the sense that no, we can, we can still do stuff. We can still, we can still change this 
this paradigm. But what I'm also interested in is what you just said, which was, you know, this is the first time ever that everyone around the globe is affected. When we take that global perspective, I absolutely see what you're saying. But what if we flip that perspective around and looked at it from a national or even local perspective? Does someone at, in India or someone in a district in India or in South Africa or at any global South country, do they feel like this is an unprecedented moment or, or is it just one of the challenges that they're, you know, one of many challenges that they're confronting? Um, and, and, and not just the pandemic itself, but also additional transformations, right? Like, like the awareness of climate change as the existential threat of our time. Is that just something that you and I that look at the world from a global perspective see? Or is it also, do you think from, in your view, is it also something that is woven into the perspectives of real people on the ground at local and national levels as well? Yeah, I, I would have liked. Maybe you can organize a discussion between Manish and I for the for the future. Because I, I, <laughs> I, I, you know, I, I'd, I'd love to engage with it. But um, we're very privileged to be able to to see to to you know to be connected, to see things globally, to be involved in lots of conversations, and to be able to gain global perspectives, which people who are in their daily grind of work on in the countryside on a small holding or a hawker on a street or any, might not have, although we should never underestimate uh, people's capacity to understand what's going on um, and their, their information flows with, with all the information that we have, often fake information flows, like the anti-vaccination one, for example. It's a contestation of ideas that takes place from the highest level to, the, to people on the streets who, who, who are getting fed all the information through different media. Um, or, or in the countryside or religious groups or others that are feeding different perspectives on what's happening. But I think people experience change in their own lives. If you go into the countryside, as I've done in South Africa and other countries, not in India, people will tell you that the climate is changing, mm -hmm. that the, the weather patterns are changing, that crops they used to plant at this season, now they have to plant a month later, or they're not getting the rain, or the yields are down. They 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 experiencing the joblessness, the inequality, they seeing the size of the of the richest people's cars and homes and, and things. They are not immune to these global trends. They're just experiencing them from the ground up. Uh, and they're recognizing that there's great change. They can't, you know, and you see in India now the protests going on, which I, I just pick up um, in small ways. People, people sense the change uh, and interpret it in their own lives. I think they, you know, poor people have always had very brute, tough lives. And in some respects, things are improving. Life expectancy numbers tend to be going up, not this year, but in previous years. Schooling is improving, rights are improving. There is progress. And that's why I think one needs to be optimistic. And that's why I believe in globalization because a lot of it has come from international flows of ideas. Um, and science and technologies, uh, but it's a struggle. And it's uh, and at the point we are at the moment in 2020, it's one step forward and two steps backwards. Uh, and unless we are able to leap ahead and get into a different frame, uh, people will be more and more affected. You know, Mumbai is going to be underwater because of climate change. Mm -hmm. Dakar in Bangladesh with the millions of people that live there, underwater. Uh, people's lives will be fundamentally changed and it's it, but it happens slowly and then suddenly you lose your livelihood and you die uh, if you are unfortunate uh, not to have the options rich people have options they'll just move to higher ground turn on the air conditioning pump water from deeper and further they can immune themselves to many of these things but it's the poor people that are at, the, at real front line of these global changes and that's why although they might not see them in the same ways uh, that we do, they're much more affected than we are. And that's why anyone that I believe that believes in solidarity and believes in poverty reduction uh, and a more inclusive world needs to fight very, very hard for it because all of these changes can go to vastly improve people's lives 
to reduce hunger. You know, the Sustainable Development Goals said eliminate poverty and hunger by 2030. That's in 10 years time. That's not gonna happen uh, unless something very radical changes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so on, on this point of unless something very radical changes, um, Carl Pogliani, uh, the famous economic historian, argued that the economy has to serve society rather than society serving the economy, right? Ha have we built economic systems that force trade-offs between economic performance and human well-being? Um, you know, are, are we at this juncture where we need a different economic paradigm that's centered on human welfare? And, and what would that actually look like? Does the current moment present an opportunity to shift trajectories in favor of this new paradigm that, that uh, is centered on human welfare as opposed to uh, the singular focus on economic progress? Yes, um, you know, there are lots of different strands of economics and there are lots of e economists who believe that. Uh, so it's, I wouldn't sort of put it economics against e uh, yes or no. Um, economics, like any subject, is a, is a toolkit uh, and it's vastly expanding. It's the question of what you use the tools for and what, and what, what your purpose is. Um, economics can be used and has been used and is used in many countries and many places to create much more inclusive, much more shared economies. Uh, there's a whole group of economists who are working out how to transition from fossil fuels to zero carbon to stop climate change. Um, but we absolutely need to reprioritize um, to make sure that economics, that our economies serve the interests of ordinary people. That's a political contestation because rich people are capturing politics. Uh, you know, in the US, at this, the most recent presidential election cost $10 billion. You need $10 million to be a congressperson. The idea that that it's a system which allows anyone to flourish is a complete fantasy. Um, this re this requires tough choices, including very high taxes on wealthy people, including inheritance taxes and wealth taxes. They're not going to like it. Uh, you know, people don't like like rich people generally don't like the idea of taxes. So it 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 becomes political very quickly. Now. My own view, and that's I'm being very encouraged by by many people that are saying this, uh, including wealthy people, is that's the only way for all of us to survive. Yeah. Um, so it's it's out of self interest, in the same way that it's out of the self interest, I believe, of rich countries to make sure that poor countries are successful and do well. It's out of the interest of rich people to also ensure that they have inclusive, sustainable societies. Then you get into the detail. But I, yes, absolutely. We need to reprioritize uh, our societies and we need to ensure that at the center of it is the well-being of every individual in the society, physical and mental. And what I think is very interesting is, is what you pointed out as sort of the, the, the political realities that sometimes preclude the realization of economic models that put human welfare first. And it's also easy to kind of kick the can down the road sometimes and say, you know, climate change is happening and it, it definitely it's the biggest existential threat for all of us, rich or poor. But, you know, maybe we can diffuse the responsibility and, and, and both kick the can down the road and expect someone else to, to take care of it. One of the issues that I've been looking at uh, in, in, in that context is this idea of, um, is this idea of, of jobs and, and how does, not, not, the, not the impact of climate change on jobs, which is of course very real as, as you just mentioned, Ian, but also the extent to which the transition from dirty fuels to more clean sources of energy would entail actually transitioning in some economies, thousands of people, not just in those sectors, but also sectors downstream from them, and what the costs of that might be. And so that's an example. For example, we take you know, the coal sector in India, and we think, okay, we're going to easily transition those people that are working in the coal sector into clean energy sectors. It's not going to happen, right? There's, there's a lot of costs entail. Uh, there's 
place-based specificities, there's uh, the you know skills training realities and educational reality, the backgrounds of a lot of these workers, there's health related issues. So you know the transition is not an easy one to make and the just transition isn't just about the impact of climate change saying okay we need to address that otherwise, but it's also about how do we mold an economic reality where where the benefits of something like that are politically salient enough to get our decision makers to actually do something <laughs> about it, right? So, uh, so, so, Ian, with that, I think ten thousand dollar question, or whatever the phrase is, million dollar question, um, and I, I would like you to respond to that and leave us with sort of your ideas for, you know, the 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 top things that need to happen, the three things that need to happen in order to mold global global governance such that we are actually, uh, we're actually reconfiguring our economic paradigm in a way that puts human welfare first. So that um, small thanks. question in the last three minutes, Ian. <laughs> Two minutes, yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> Thanks, Sabina, and thanks for having me. And I'm, I'm, uh, you know, it, it's been great. The 30 minutes has really flown by. Um, I think, as you've highlighted with this question of the just transition on energy, uh, when we, we, the reason, and you see this dramatically in the Midwest of the U.S., where people who've lost their manufacturing jobs supported President Trump, like the people in the north of England supported Brexit um, and crazy ideas, which are not in their interests, which will destroy the economy in the same way that D Trump has destroyed many things in the US. Um, but people basically uh, are worried about their jobs and their incomes. And we need to be able to respond to that when we say to people, we want to close down the coal mines, we want to close down the power stations. It's good for the country. And it is. And it's good for the world. Um, you have to give people uh, an opportunity and it's often in a different place and they don't want to move they lived and their families and their lives have been where they are uh you have to give them vouchers you have to give them an ability to move and you have to give them a guarantee that if they lose their jobs they will not starve so you have to pay them basically pensions what even if they're 40 for the rest of their lives because it's in the national interest society wants them to do something they don't want to do and they have to be supported in that How's it going to be paid for? The rich countries are going to have to pay much more. They account for the majority of the stock of carbon in the atmosphere. For 100 years, Britain was the biggest carbon emitter in the world after the Industrial Revolution. Now it's only 5%. Uh, China's you know, doubled the US. But historically, the US is well over three times the amount of carbon in the atmosphere. So the rich countries are going to have to pay their historical obligations. And that is part of the carbon transition. But India and other countries also need to contribute. And we're going to have to pay more for energy in the transition. In the long term, the price of energy will go down. So we have to look after those that are losing their jobs. Uh, but, that, that, but their concern about their jobs cannot stop, in, stop us doing the carbon transition. Because to say to them, OK, we're not going to let you in your job to produce coal for the rest of your lives, is going to be direct India and the world. Uh, so uh, that's not an option. My final one minute uh, on priorities and, and what this all means. My hope is the pandemic is a huge wake up call that we don't reset and go back to the operating system we had uh, when it's over, that it's given us a time for reflection. It's taught us what's important in our lives, the value of friendships, of family, of solidarity, of young for old who are making massive sacrifices. And that out of that, we are prepared to give more. There's been a rush of volunteerism, which is incredible. People putting their lives at stake in hospitals around the world and in other areas to support those uh, in need. That needs to be translated into action at the global level. The fact that aid is going down this year because the income of the rich countries going down is a scandal. The fact that the rich countries have found $12 trillion for themselves in packages to support their workers and things, and less than 1% for poor countries, the vaccine nationalism. These are the things that we need to 
rebel against, we need to protest against, uh, and we need to create a more inclusive and sustainable world. If we don't uh, engage in this battle of ideas, and it is a battle of what's right, uh, then one is giving over the space. And inertia of the system will mean we just carry on as we were before. So it's a time for action, uh, for reflection, and uh, we have every possibility for creating a better world. But it won't happen on its own. It'll happen because good people uh, make it happen. And uh, my hope is that your conversations are part of that process. So thank you for inviting me uh, to join you and good luck to you and to all the participants. Thank you so much, Ian. It's been a real pleasure. As you said, the half an hour just flew by. And, you know, I, um, I really believe in people that bring uh, intellect, that bring their influence, that bring uh, their hard work, um, but also bring a great deal of heart to be able to, to address these major challenges and see humanity as a whole. And you're definitely one of those people, Ian. So thank you so much for, for participating in this discussion, for engaging in this conversation, for enlightening us and for, and for motivating us and inspiring us to keep going. Um, and I, and I, and I'm, um, so, so thank you so much for that. And I'm also really excited about the next set of speakers that we have because both Govind and uh, Govind Dataraj and Anurag Bihar are, um, are people of the same ilk. So <laughs> as, as that. Um, and so I, I'll start by just introducing Govind Etheraj, who is a television and print journalist and founder of India Spend, um, as well as Boom, which is a fact checking initiative. He anchors seasonal shows on Indian news television and also writes for newspapers such as the business standard. Um, I know for a fact, Govind, that, is, that that is a really modest bio and that, that you are someone who has uh, far more, more influence on ideas and on uh, communications of those ideas and on policy debates and, and discourse, global discourse on the future of work and, and, and a wide range of, of subjects. And so Govind, with that, thank you so much for agreeing to engage in this, um, in this interview. And I will pass it on to you both. So now I get to sit with my popcorn and, and, and watch um, and, and listen and be inspired by, um, by you both. So over to you. Thank you. Uh, so thank you so much. Uh, and for those who've been watching, uh, I'm sure you've been following the train of thought uh, on uh, creating jobs and the challenges ahead. I'm pleased to be joined by Anurag Behar, the CEO of Azim Premji Foundation. Um, the the challenge uh, in the larger context, of course, is to uh, is to bring back a semblance of reality uh, in the post pandemic economy and being the subject of our discussion as well. But equally, is this an opportunity to uh, design or redesign some things which we perhaps could not do earlier? And looking specifically at education and the new education policy, which came in the middle of the pandemic, on the, in the end of July, in the middle of the pandemic and the lockdown, uh, uh, and uh, was, has been hailed as a fairly transformative uh, document uh, in, uh, in uh, pushing all the right buttons and uh, uh, maybe uh, likely to take uh, India in the direction that it's supposed to take. So that's, that's the broad sense. But there are two or three issues that uh, we would like to focus on, and I'm going to uh, hand it over to Anurag in a moment. But one is, of course, uh, uh, the kind of education that will come in uh, over time as this policy comes into place, if it comes into place in the manner that it's been intended. Secondly, uh, even particularly as we look at education in, uh, for younger people, the future of this country, uh, does it combine the right elements of uh, vocational training? And uh, finally, does it lead to the kind of employability that will make uh, this country better or stronger or, and so on? So those are some of the broader questions, but uh, I'm sure the way Anurag will uh, articulate it is to first look at the building blocks and whether uh, and which is what I would ask him as well, uh, whether this new education policy uh, is creating the right or uh, in the direction of creating the right building blocks to uh, take us uh, to uh, the right future that we want, particularly for our youth. So uh, on that broad note, uh, let me hand over to Anurag Bihar for his opening remarks, post which uh, I'll uh, throw a few questions at him. And those of you who wish to ask questions and uh, leave comments, be, uh, please feel free to do so. I'm uh, checking the chat box. Uh, it's over to you, Anurag. 
Thanks, Govind. Thank you so much. Uh, that word that you used, transformative, uh, I, I, I do think that the policy is potentially transformative. Uh, and, uh, and as one can guess, that word potential is to do with how is it going to get implemented, right? Uh, but nevertheless, my sense is that the policies of a kind where even if 20% is implemented, is going to be transformative. So a couple of things about the policy first. One, that it's uh, the first national education policy in the past 34 years. Two, the mandate of the policy is to look at Indian education absolutely fundamentally. And this policy is not looking out for the next three or five years, but it's looking out for the next 20, 25, 30 years. That's the mandate. If you, if you see the policy in the context of the discussion that we've been having here, let's start from what is the aim of education as articulated in the policy? And it might seem like a strange place to start, but in education, there are, that's perhaps the most important thing. What is education for? And uh, the aim of education as committed to in the policy is that education should build good India. A good India in big part is about the India which reflects the kind of constitutional values that we've committed to ourselves in 1950. But a big part of the good India, of course, is an economically vibrant India. An India where people are getting good and just jobs. They're creating livelihood opportunities. So the policy therefore, and this is an important point to note, it doesn't see education as an instrument, as an economic instrument. It sees education as the most important social process for developing good society. But inherent in that definition of good society is the importance of a vibrant economy and therefore good and just jobs. Now, let's move to some of the building blocks as you call them, right? In this particular context. First, the first thing is that the, the policy takes a very important position, which I think is a much needed position and a much needed understanding in our country and elsewhere as well, which is that skilling, training, stuff like that is no substitute for good sound fundamental education. So the policy is intent on actually improving education in India such that it develops those fundamental capacities in all our young that are required today and will be required even more tomorrow for many things, but even more importantly, to get good jobs, to be employable as you were calling them. And this is too often, and it's, a, it's actually a very simple thing, but it's too often missed that as the world changes and changes even faster, the jobs that are available today, the employment opportunities that are available to be today, the livelihoods that are available today, they won't be there the same five years later, 10 years later. So what is it that the young of today must develop such that they have a lifetime of gainful employment, good employment, just employment, right? And those are the fundamental capacities that the policy commits to developing in all our young. What are these fundamental capacities? Uh, there are cognitive capacities like critical thinking, analysis, creativity. There are social capacities, working in teams, living well, well with people, communication. And underlying both these is essentially, a, a, let's call it a fundamental knowledge base. You can't do both these in the absence of, let's say, basic literacy or a basic understanding of how our democracy operates. So the first big part is it the policy's deep commitment to developing these fundamental capacities, which really are the most important thing over the next 30, 40 years for any young person. Second, and the second one is more specific to what you're pointing out. The policy does something uh, I think which is much needed and very interesting about vocational education. And it does two things, one, 
it takes actions which actually will now bring vocational education into the mainstream. You know, in our country, vocational education has been this uh, poor cousin. If you can't do anything, you do vocational education, right? But the policy makes specific efforts and takes actions such that vocational education can come in the mainstream. And second, of course, it tries to improve the quality of vocational education. And how is it doing that? Essentially, what it's doing is it's integrating vocational education into schooling and into undergrad education in a manner by which every student would have to do vocational education. So every student would have to do humanities, physical sciences, arts, music, and vocational education. Let's see how all this gets implemented. This is, uh, you know, this is really, this part is amongst the many things that are truly transformative. I think the first important step on this matter, at least in the school sector, is gonna be the National Curricular Framework 2021. And uh, I'm very hopeful that that will really set the pace for this. Okay, uh, thanks for that, Anurag. So let me uh, throw a few, few quick questions. So uh, you've, you've come from industry. I mean, when I say industry, it's in a broad sense, not necessarily uh, heavy engineering, but that includes software as well. And uh, your, I, I don't know if it's a sister, parent, umbrella company, that's Wipro, uh, which deals in manpower. Now, uh, suppose this policy was in place, uh, let's say 20 years ago, in the manner that you envision it. What kind of people do you think it would have produced or would it have produced uh, which or who you think would have made a better Wipro, for example, or a better uh, uh, GE or any such company? So Govind, just for the sake of clarification, I do come from heavy engineering. Okay. <laughs> and, yes. I know uh, Wipro engineering. Yeah, I know, no, I know that. Yeah. And the foundation owns a lot of Wipro. So in a sense, we are the parent. <laughs> so having said that, uh, you know what, uh, let me take you back to the engineering business. It's a precision engineering business that I was responsible for for many years when I was in business. And what would we struggle with? It's not that we were not struggling with getting the right kind, kind of welders. We were struggling with that. But getting the welding training organized is a much easier thing. What we were truly struggling with was problem solving capacities of our people. And when, when it talks about problem solving capacity, it's about communication, it's about analysis, it's about synthesis, right? And that is something which you and I have both gone through the same education system. Our road focused education system, it actually systematically destroys, right? It destroys curiosity. And that is curiosity, by the way, is also at the heart of problem solving. So if this, this policy had been there, then I think what could have happened is the fundamental stuff that we struggle with today, or I used to struggle when I was responsible for a business, that would go away. It would actually make things a lot easier, not just from an operational perspective, but financially, that we would really end up training, let me uh, use that word, I'm very hesitant with that word, but we will, we will be able to do training on very specific things that can be done very quickly, right? And, uh, uh, and not, to, not to not mention that, it's also the social capacities that I talked about, the matter of teamwork, language. You know, this particular policy is so focused on ensuring that all children develop really deep language capacities, multilingualism actually, right? And that's been so important in business as well. So that's how I think, you know, I wish, I wish this had happened 30 years ago. Yeah. Right, so you know, uh, when, when you start breaking down the building blocks, now if you were to look ahead, uh, this is of course a hypothetical uh, rear, rear facing question, but if you were to now look ahead, how do you, I mean, and this is a different world. I mean, uh, the world when you came in, it was more maybe engineering and software was its, as at its uh, infancy. And now uh, software digital technology is obviously very evolved. Uh, and the skills and uh, the employability equations have changed and are changing even faster. Uh, that and that's one part of it. The other is, uh, you know, and you use the word is uh, the good society, and and are the ingredients the same for this? And how do you break it up when when you break break up the building blocks, and does it all arrive at the same place? So, uh, Govin, I don't think uh, the characteristics of good society have changed much for the past two thousand years or ten thousand years, right? Human virtues have been the same. 
So uh, the fact that we have to live with empathy, the fact that we have to be good to each other, we have to be ethical, right? And we have to fend for ourselves with courage, with resilience. That has remained the same. And uh, that's why I'm so heartened by the policy that it has not taken shortcuts. Its mandate was not to take shortcuts, right? It's not a three-year policy. It has not taken shortcuts. It has really focused on you know, what I've now maybe used five times or six times, the fundamental human capacities. And uh, as I think of the policy and, is, and, and the, in the way it'll get implemented, what it does is that it puts that matter of the fundamental human capacities in a current context. So let's take an example. There's been some criticism around this matter that why has the policy or the first, uh, you know, the first actions from the policy led to the idea of computational thinking in classrooms, in school? Yes, it seems odd, but one should not think of computational thinking only in the context of computer science or IT. The policy or the curriculum that will be drawn from the policy is actually using computational thinking in the context of those fundamental capacities. So much as it's focused on the very fundamental and the most important matters, it's really contextualizing this in the current world. Part two, and I think this is very, very important, very important. When we talk like this in a group like this, you know, our minds are just too often limited by the Bangalore's of the world or the Delhi's of the world and the, uh, let's call the fancy schools of this country, right? That's what where India is. 90% of India goes to schools, lives in conditions, you know, which, uh, uh, which they should not be living in. And therefore, a, 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 an absolutely central thrust of the policy is that all this that we are talking about, all this that we are talking about should be available to the child who lives in deep disadvantage today. So how do you restructure the system? What all do you need to do to make it such that every child has access to this? And, you know, all of us are familiar with this country. It's not gonna happen in two years time, but as I mentioned, the policy is looking at the next 20 years. And, you know, I, I just cannot overemphasize the importance of this particular matter. We should look at are we able to do this kind of education, not in Bangalore or in Delhi, but actually in some small, small village, which is about 100 kilometers from Barmer or a distant town in the mountains, right? And the policy is very focused on that. And it threads all the actions, I think, very artfully together to make this happen. Right. And, and you've uh, contributed a fair bit to this policy as well, uh, Anurag. So, uh, give us an example or an illustration of uh, you know this village, hundred village or town, hundred kilometers from Barmer. Uh, are, are, are you do you belong to that place or uh, Rajasthan or? Barmer is uh, my metaphor of choice. Okay, okay, <laughs> okay. So uh, how would, what would change? I mean, so let's say policy kicks in and uh, you know things start rolling. So what could change in three, five, seven years in a a school or a illustrative school in in the in a place like that? in the way you see it? Yeah, the first thing is I would encourage you to go to Barmer if you haven't been there, Not yet. everybody here. Uh, it's, a, it's a very, very stark place, right? It's a stark place with beautiful hearts, right? So they, they say there in Hindi, log yaha rote hue aate hain aur rote hue jaate hain. When you come there, you just don't want to go there. But if you're supposed to leave, you just can't leave the place. That bar me is such a hard place. What would happen as the policy gets rolled out? First, the first thing that would happen is that the basics will come into place. Now, when I say basics, these are real basics. Is there a toilet? Does the toilet have running water? Uh, are the children getting the uniform in the month of May as they're supposed to, or do they get in December? Are the textbook arriving on time? Is there chalk? Right? This is the kind of basics I'm talking about. But the shocking reality is that these basics are not there or too often not there in very many of our classrooms. So the basics will be there. Second, there'll be adequate number of teachers. And you know we just miss this completely, completely miss this, which is that today we have a situation where 
you have grade eight and the grade eight is being taught mathematics. And by the way, mathematics is important therefore to all kinds of employment opportunities. And that mathematics is being taught by a teacher who herself has not studied mathematics beyond grade six or grade eight. How can that happen? So second, you'll have adequate number of teachers and those adequate number of teachers will be appropriately qualified, right? Third, third is very important. Let's face it, we have an absolute learning crisis on our hands in this country, a very basic learning crisis. Kids are not able to learn how to read and write and to do basic arithmetic. All these wonderful things that I was talking about, about the basic capacities and all that, you can throw it out of the window when the basic stuff is not there. So the policy conference that matter, and I'm very heartened by that, the policy conference that matter head on, it acknowledges the crisis. And it's a rare occurrence where a government document acknowledges a crisis of this nature with such clarity. It conference it head on, it takes specific steps to deal with the crisis over the next five to seven years. It can't be done in a year, but next five to seven years. So that's third that you will have a change in. Fourth, very important, it's going to, transform the curriculum and pedagogical approach that we have today to something which is going to be very age appropriate. I won't go into the depths of that, which is, it's going to go to, today we call it, you know, the 10 plus two plus three is going to go to five plus three plus three plus four. The important part of that is the pedagogical curricular approach will be age appropriate. Most importantly, there'll be huge investment in early childhood education. And that's very important. We know that the most important developmental stage is the stage of, let's say, up to age eight, actually from conception up to age eight. And there's a huge investment and focus in that early childhood years in this, in, this, uh, in this policy. You know, I can just go on, but I'll stop with a couple of more things. As a part of the curricular and pedagogical transformation, what it's gonna do, it's, it's gonna introduce vocational education from grade six and Importantly, it's not introducing vocational education in a manner by which you're separating vocational education and some kids will do vocational education, some others will do academic or mainstream. Every child will have to do a bit of vocational education. And that, as I had mentioned earlier, addresses the matter of this notion that somehow vocational education is a, a, a lower cousin, right? And lastly, to enable all this to happen, to enable all this to happen, it's actually going to have a fundamental transformation on how schools are regulated, how schools are governed, how teachers are prepared. The teacher education system, the BH system, which is in some senses really the most defunct part of our education system, it's again confronting it head on, right? So all the stuff that I described to you, it won't happen unless everything else that actually makes it happen, supports it, is really changed, right? So it's a very comprehensive set of measures. And the fact is, that unless you take these comprehensive set of measures, you won't really get very far. And uh, I mean, there are a couple of uh, interesting questions that have come in. I'm going to pose them to you, uh, Anurag. But what's the what's the critical link here? I mean, uh, particularly at the administrative level to to ensure things happen. Uh, I mean, it is a state subject uh, and uh, school. I mean, so I mean, where do you? Where, I mean, where is the point that you need to watch the most to ensure that uh, you know, for instance, ensure that the teachers are rightly trained, they spend enough time in schools, that they change to a newer way of thinking, uh, a new approach to their own students, and so on. Yeah, I mean, you said something which again I must point out: teachers spend enough time in schools. Actually, teachers do spend enough time in schools, right? And most teachers, and, and we've dealt with over the past 20 years, lakhs of teachers, literally lakhs of teachers, right? Public school teachers, government school teachers. And a large majority of them are just outstanding people, deeply committed people. It's a question of how are we supporting? What culture are we creating? You gotta, if you want to focus on, let's say three things, if you want to focus on three things, these are the three things you should focus on. One, what's coming out of the National Curricular Framework 2021? I hope it comes out in 2021. It's such a complex thing that it might take another year and that's all right. But watch out for what's gonna happen in NCF that's gonna come out. And there'll be a cascade that the state curricular frameworks will be formed. And I think that's gonna be very important. That's part one. Part two, we need to focus on what kind of reforms are truly happening in the teacher education system. All these totally corrupt 
be it colleges, you know, which are basically shams, shops, are they being shut unless they're improving? Are there good teacher education programs being set up? I think that's absolutely critical. That's the second part. And the third part uh, is the governance and regulatory setup that the policy has laid down. And is it going, moving towards that? That's not going to happen overnight at all. But are we going to see school complexes, thereby schools are able to share a lot more resources? Is the regulation going to become much more empowering to schools and involving of communities? So watch these three spaces, the NCF, the teacher education system, and the regulation and governance of schools. Right. Okay. So, uh, I mean, this is about employability and it is uh, hosted by Just Jobs. So we'll come back to that in a moment. So let me use a couple of questions to, uh, to bring that in. Uh, Roshni uh, Nagahalli asks, uh, thanks Anurag. I appreciate your stressing on the importance of vocational education as a core part of the process. But the uh, NCF, that's the National Curriculum Framework for 2005, also had work education as a core part of it that did not get too far. Why do you think that the new NCF under this NEP, that's the education policy, will make a difference? We have to watch what happens, as I said. But the principle that this is adopting is entirely different. The principle that this is adopting is not the matter of work education, right? The principle that this is adopting is that vocational education should be integrated from grade six. So what it's what essentially it is moving towards is six, seventh, could we develop, let's call them skills, right? And later on, can can put it into capacities. And then the capacities can be built upon in 9, 10, 11, 12th into vocations, right? So the kind of approach, if I may say it another way. Many of you might be familiar with the notion of, let's call it liberal education or liberal arts education in undergrad. What this is doing is it's bringing down that liberal arts notion into the schooling system, and it is making vocational education as let's call it a core or a compulsory set of subjects, right? And therefore it will ensure that all children go through vocational education. It is gonna give it the same importance as you might give to mathematics or physics or biology or the languages. And uh, any country that's uh, implemented this uh, if very well, which is a is is a maybe a example or a beacon of some sort, uh, Anurag. Well, you know the thing is that we have had a particular history of vocational education where we've given this you know lower status, and therefore the kind of stuff that we have to deal with, not many countries have had to deal with. So I can't think of an exact uh, exact analogy. It is truly transformative in that main manner, but countries such as Finland or Sweden where there is very, very significant flexibility between switching between vocational and academic. Those are very good parallels. In fact, in those countries, this has been very successful. So at a, at a level of the principle, it really is not doing something dramatically different, but from a structural perspective, it really is gonna transform what we have today. Right, okay. Uh, so uh, we're almost out of time. So let me use the, uh, the last, the question comment. Go, go in the, just to say that you can you actually have another 10 to 15 minutes if 10 you minutes like. okay uh jayashree asks uh, aren't there other ways and this is really a future question so then let me go to the future and come back to the present uh, aren't there other ways uh, in which we can ensure the outcomes we want through the policy uh, without waiting for another 20 years and uh, what will happen in these 20 years to the children and young people who have to work harder to retain their curiosity ability to question challenge stereotypes without any support systems and that's in a way, I mean, the question that I also wanted to pose, and maybe I could put it as an addendum, is how, how long will this uh, roll out? Is it uh, one generation, two generation, or can it be more uh, specifically defined, uh, Anurag? Yeah. So uh, I wish it could happen overnight. And <laughs> the problem is, this really is a problem which is that we've tried to do so many things overnight in the past 20 years that nothing has happened, <laughs> right? So, uh, you know, let's recognize this. Let's recognize this. Let's, let's recognize reality as it is, not as we wish it to be. And that is that changing education and a complex system, and by far the most complex system, it's more complex than the healthcare system, right? not just in India, anywhere in the world, it takes enormous time. It is what is known very, very much. It's a classic instance of what is called a wicked problem, right? 
so this is going to take time let's let's accept it because of this desire to to have quick victories quick wins see quick results we actually let go of the most important and fundamental things and then 20 years later we look back and see we have not progressed so let's 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 actually commit to this thing that we will stay the course for 20 years 30 years and we'll see the transformation happen by the way the finish education system which everybody looks up to did that it said in the 1950s that this is our direction these are the fundamental changes we'll make and they stayed the course they have stayed the course that's why they are where they are now having said that having said that i must point out which i pointed out earlier very very briefly that the policy confronts some of the immediate issues right away so it confronts the issue of the basic learning crisis on literacy and numeracy right away it invests into it it develops programs early childhood education it confronts that particular matter right away if you were to ask me if you were to prioritize money the money should go into early childhood education as much as the policy itself says so right teacher education it confronts that issue right away so it's not shying away from issues that need to be confronted right away it's doing so even there even there let's recognize that nothing is going to happen in a year's time you can see directional movement even the learning crisis that i was talking about the basic learning crisis i would be thrilled i would be absolutely thrilled if we have really solved that problem substantially not wholly but substantially over the next 5 years right and uh, let me uh, flip the question around in a manner but you know so if you were a parent let's say uh, who's listening and many obviously are uh, or if you're an educationist i mean uh, you know you run a institution you're a principal or a teacher what could you be doing to embrace some of this to actually action it already and, and i'm sure people are people are in their own ways but uh, you know one is the top down and that's what the policy does and uh, if it has to go to barmer in the way that you envision it i'm sure it requires that top down push but there are others who could uh, literally uh, you know pick up uh, the th- uh, the ball and start running right away what could they do um uh, govin step one read it step i'll repeat that step one is read it please right i am mystified by the controversy around the policy because stuff that i read in the media is just not there or when this criticism that this is not there it's already there and what i would recommend to everybody is please read the 484 pages of the dr kasturi rangan report on the basis of which the policy was formulated the 66 page policy document which is approved by the union cabinet in july is essentially a summary of that 484 page document so i would encourage you to read that please read it one two empower empower your teachers if you're running an institution empower your teachers that i think is one of the key issues that the policy attempts to address empowering teachers in very many ways empowering institutions so if you're running an institution please empower and if you're a parent please stop focusing on exactly how many marks your child is getting could you please stop start focusing on what i've been calling the fundamental capacities and what is your child school doing about the fundamental capacities right that's two and three and three is that please put your voice you know please put your voice behind this policy because this policy is not going to happen unless significant increases in public investment happen the policy commits to increasing public investment in education from the current 3 odd percent of gdp to 6 odd percent of gdp from 10 percent of overall public expenditure to 20 percent it's not going to happen unless there is significant overall political and social pressure so we got to make it happen make people commit to you in elections that they will make this happen and vote for them or vote them out right uh, anurag uh, you worked on this policy for a long time and i'm sure even as you worked on it uh, it had it went through many iterations uh, what's missing if uh, at the end of this uh, if anything and uh, what in your way is the most significant outcome of this policy i mean you've given several uh, and uh, all pointing to a pretty powerful objective or transformation but is there one thing that uh, you were particularly pleased that emerged from this uh, and and your efforts that you've put in 
Yeah, you know, Govind is like my daughter pushing me. Tell me your most favorite Hindi song. How can I tell you my most favorite Hindi song? <laughs> it's like that. So you push me of all stuff in this policy, push me for that one thing, that one thing. That's the early childhood education, way. you know? So I mean, if you were to take out everything and say, look, I got a billion dollars every year over the next 10 years, and we're gonna invest it only into one thing, only into one thing, right? This arbitrary decision. I would say, put it into early childhood education. That is going to change this country, absolutely. Okay, uh, here's a question that I'm also keen to ask, uh, and uh, it's uh, suitably anonymous. Uh, the anonymous attendee asks, uh, what is your view on white hat junior coding classes for kids? Uh, and and I, I'm, I'm picking up the larger theme, right? So there is, there is pressure. I mean, it's the same pressure that you refer to, but that pressure here is transformed into, uh, uh, you know, the IT and tech space saying that you need to uh, learn coding at the age of five, otherwise you have no hope. Uh, and it's the same uh, pressure that parents came into because parents are between fear and insecurity, uh, you know, and, and most Indian parents are like that. So uh, what's your view, Anurag? It's a, it's a completely silly idea. Completely. Please, please throw it out of hand. And the policy, by the way, the policy, by the way, is absolutely explicit. What it does is it creates what is this called the foundational stage, age three to eight, which includes the current classes one and two. And it's clearly, clearly saying, look, let's commit to a pedagogical approach and the kind of learning in, in that age group, which is play-based. This nonsense that we are doing of getting such young kids and, you know, I, I didn't even catch the phrase that you said, you know, uh, but uh, some coding stuff, right? So it's a very silly idea. Let's just focus on keeping our children happy at that age. Let them develop, let them develop socially, emotionally, ethically, right? And, uh, and, and, and the, I think what's going to be this very progressive curriculum framework that's going to come out, let's implement that, right? And don't fear at all. Actually, you should fear if you're teaching your kids white hat coding or whatever that was at that age. They will not be able to do anything else 10 years later. And the world is going to be dramatically different 10, 15 years later. So what you want your kids to be is to have the flexibility. They actually should have, they should learn the ability to learn, learning to learn, right? That's what is going to make a difference over the next 25, 30, 40 years of their life. Right. Uh, Anurag, that's a very, very uh, uh, powerful and uh, useful uh, note to uh, end on. I mean, I meant the happy children will uh, make a good society uh, as they progress through life uh, and ignoring maybe all these pressures that are thrust upon them through marketing and so on. Uh, Anurag, it's been a pleasure talking to you. Uh, thank you so much for sharing your thoughts. Uh, I do wish uh, you and for all the work that you've put in uh, personally, uh, and your organization, uh, and the, uh, the, that it finds its way into the policy, and the policy itself starts uh, rolling out the manner in which uh, those of you who have worked on it envisioned it. Uh, thank you once again, and thank you, Just Jobs, for inviting me to uh, have this conversation. It's back to you, Sabina. Govind, thank you so much. It's a pleasure. My pleasure. Thank you so much, uh, Govind, and, and thank you so much, uh, Anurag.